Welcome to the City of Hope Greater St. Mary Church, a historic congregation situated in Bedford-Stuyvesant Heights in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you for joining us today in our morning worship. It is hoped that the word, worship, and the time of prayer will be a blessing to you and your family. Let's go to church. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15, and then to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Here begins the reading of God's word. You'll follow the translation on the monitors and that in your Bibles. And here begins the reading of God's word. Samuel left immediately for Ramah, and Saul went home to Gibeah. Samuel, see this, had nothing to do with Saul from then on. Though he grieved long and deeply over him, 
But God was sorry he had ever made Saul king in the first place. Chapter 16, verse 1. God addressed Samuel, and this is where we want to park. So, how long are you going to mope over Saul? You know I've rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your flask with anointing oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've spotted the very king I wanted among his sons. The word of the Lord. There is a sacredness in tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are the messengers of overwhelming grief, of deep contrition, and of unspeakable love. These are the words of Washington Irving in one of his many writings. Our Lenten journey brings us into this particular passage, a familiar one about having to give up, to let go, and to move on. What a challenge. Have you ever shed tears over someone, something, and thought you would never stop crying? That's a question which if responded to openly and honestly, hands would be raised all over this place today. If you have suffered a loss, a disappointment, a setback, or felt that you were stuck in life, you know what it is like to cry, to grieve and mourn, and earnestly believe that there is no end to your tears. But just as every cup has a bottom, there is a day when you will cry your last tear. I want to talk to you from the subject today, my last tears. And would you help me with this witness and just share with anybody and everybody in your area today and tell them this is your last cry. <laughs> I probably should have asked you to say this is your last cry over this. The story before us today is one that has details which begin with the selection of a king at the people's request of God. We want to be like other nations. We want someone we can see. We want a man in the flesh standing before us. It is somewhat disturbing how people can want what others have and not know that what they have is so much better. God would speak to his servant and his servant would speak to the people. Other nations had monarchs and uh, Israel had God, priests and prophets. Other nations had gods of wood and of metal and of clay made out of some substance with their own hands which meant their gods were only as powerful as its creator. However, they passed, they pressed God for a king, and they received what they asked for. I believe that there is some wisdom in the thought, be careful of what you ask for. You just might get it. Make us a king to judge us like other nations. Make us a king to judge us like other nations. This is scary. This is troubling. This is disturbing. Trading the mercies of God for the judgment of men. The details of this story says more than we can possibly know about Saul. The prophet was looking for Saul to anoint him. It was difficult to locate him because he was chasing his father's lost donkeys. Imagine looking for the next king, and the next king, or the man to be anointed king, is out chasing donkeys. In 
thinking about this, I was wondering how often is it that there is a higher calling waiting and the one called higher is occupied with chasing donkeys. What would happen, what would happen, what would happen, uh, what happens when uh, there is something much greater waiting for us and we are chasing something that is so much less important and less urgent. If you go back and read in uh, 1 Samuel 8, I believe it is, the story plays out with God telling jokes. And, and Saul is the punchline. When they find Saul, before they anoint him, they had to tell him, you can stop running. Those donkeys you were chasing, they found their way home. Y'all don't get it. That's kind of, you running after something that you think is lost, and it found its way home. And we looking for you, the donkey chaser, to make you king. There's a statement there. Surely he had to know that those donkeys would at some point keep running in a circle until they circle themselves. I, I, I. The chase comes to an end when Saul meets Samuel and he is told of his selection to be anointed as king over Israel. I'm not Samuel, but I think at that moment I probably would have needed to have had another conversation God, look God, this boy was out here running down some donkeys. And he didn't even know that his daddy's donkeys found their way home. You sure you want this man who couldn't reason out animal behavior to be over your whole I am going to move away from this, but, but don't you see so many people today with titles, thrones, crosses, rings, big chairs, chasing donkeys, while they miss a higher calling? You can go ahead and say amen. I'm going on because some of y'all getting real nervous. <laughs> Saul had a promising look. He had a promising appearance. Saul is described as the son of Benjamin, of a Benjamin, a Benjamin Mite. He was tall, he was handsome. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Saul would be described in today's vernacular as a, as a tall glass of water, cool glass of water, a sweet piece of man candy, and some more things I'm sure I cannot say here and now. I do want you to remember how he is described as good-looking, tall, Handsome. He is the choices of his father's sons. Will you remember that, won't you? Saul had a good start, but slowly, gradually, deeply, and fully pulls away, grows away from God's prophet, and then ultimately away from God. In looking through the passages before the text, there is one event after another where Saul did his own thing, went his own way, and served his own causes. This behavior became displeasing and unsettling with Samuel and certainly with God. 
The lesson, however, seems to be the last straw for God, Samuel, and the people who asked for him. This is the last straw. It's something here when God gives you what you ask for, and now your prayer turns around. Lord, get this thing away from me. And then we pray those real urgent prayers. Move right now, God. Move him right now. Right now. Right now. No, no, God said, just, just hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. When I tried to give you better, you kept pressing me for what you wanted. So, so uh, easy delivery will make you forget what brought you to this place. Oh, I'm going to get rid of him because I'm tired of him. But his choices have to play out to its maximum. What do you do when you have come to the last straw in a relationship, a partnership, which has gone wrong in the wrong direction? This is the question which we all have struggled with at some time or another. And if you have not, keep living because it's plugged into your journey. Yes, there is a place in life when those whom you love cherish, who you want nothing but the very best for and would do anything within your power to help them in becoming all the best that they can be, what do you do when their choices are not yours? What do you do when they choose foolishly, recklessly, and dangerously? Have you ever hung on to someone or something, hoping and praying they will see the wisdom in choosing differently and choosing wisely? The more you talk and pleaded, the deeper they dug themselves in. Oh, that is heart-wrenching. It is a miserable experience. There is a truth that we all must face in that we can either choose for someone else or make up someone else's mind for them. Even though it might be for the best as much as you would like to, the reality is you cannot. Saul has crossed this line for the last time. He has made his last bad choice. He has told his last bad lie. He has offended God for the last time. It bothers me that Saul thought he could continue to do his own thing in direct disobedience to God. It would take some time to go through all of his offenses. They are detailed to, um, uh, they are detailed, uh, too detailed for us to just skim through. Those who have an aversion to the truth think long and hard as to how they will tell a fictitious story convincingly. You know, as if it were the actual truth. That's the trait of one drawing away from God. It is that your lies become your truth. It becomes the trait of the one drawn away from God to convince others that their lie is the truth. <laughs> yes, this is the time we live in alternative facts. I watched the news yesterday. I really didn't mean to, but I did. And alternative facts play out before us every day. I did not say repeal and replace. And here's how it came across. I did not say repeal and replace. It was like the newscaster's dream. August 2016, we will repeat, repeal and we will replace. September, 
we will repeal and we will replace. October, we will repeal and we will replace. November 1st, 2016, we will repeal and we will replace. The day after election, the first thing that we will do in office is that we will repeal which one of your lies are you believing? Do you know that what we're seeing broadcast in front of us is what plays out in front of us every day in the circles in which we function? That people have repealed and replaced the truth. Yeah, with alternative facts. They ain't give me no offering today, so you... <laughs> and the alternative facts have become that truth and I want to tell you something you can fool anybody you want to fool and try to change anybody's mind you want to change but the one person you cannot change is God's mind and God's word I thought I was talking to some church folk here's what God said heaven and earth will pass away before one jot or one tittle of his word would change. You need to be comfortable in that. I recall during the campaign season, the candidate said, everything is going to change. Everything is, everything, everything. Everything is going to change. I stood in the middle of my kitchen and I laughed. And I said, <laughs> first of all, <laughs> Washington don't work like that. Well, actually, second of all, Washington don't work like that. But the first thing you forgot, Mr. Candidate, is the one thing you can't change is God. You might be in the White House, in the Oval Office, in the big seat. But there's one who says, higher. And your heart is in his head. Yeah. So folk walking around worried and they don't understand why you're not. Listen, it's just got to play out. It's just got to play out. It's just, it, it, it just got to play out all the way to the end. This is another one of those Saul and people choices. People who never voted before went to the polls and voted and made a decision. Now they've got to live with their decision. But what happens to us? We see the hand of God still, God didn't change. God did not change. God did not change. That does not mean that we are passive and we sit back and be silent. Oh, that we have a responsibility in the process. But while we're in the process, we know that God's got it all. This is troubling that he thought God would not know the truth about his lies. Let's look at the last lie here, the last lie here. God, um, Saul, was instructed to go and attack Amalek. The attack was God's vengeance on Amalek for what he did to Israel. He ambushed them on their way out of Egypt. I, no, don't, don't, don't. Let me keep going. Because that, that would take me into another. So here's what God told him. Don't spare anything. Just go in and kill and get out. I know this sounds harsh. Would God do something? Yeah, 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 God would. Because he can Many times he speaks to us and tell us to go in certain areas and certain places in our life, shut the door, kill some things, and don't, don't salvage, just burn it down, tear it up, kill it, shut the door and get out. Get out. Don't, don't, don't try to hold on to anything. I don't know if any of you ever dated somebody way back in your life. And when it was not working out, you decided to break up. And one of, one of y'all 
He said, well, we still going to be friends, aren't we? We friends, right? You know. <laughs> See, under, underneath that, what you're really saying, I know this is over, but don't close the door all the way. Do not spare anyone or anything. Kill both man, woman, infant, and nursing child. Kill the ox, kill the sheep, kill the camel, and the donkey. They went into battle. They went into battle. Saul spared Agag. He sorted out the best of the sheep. He spared them. He sorted out the oxen. He took the best of the oxen. He took the best of the fatlings, the lambs. And anything that looked good to him, he spared it. Saul didn't see the genealogy, the genogram. It's that traits start way back and they come down to the next generation. They don't always reveal themselves in the next generation, but the trait is still there. So even though it don't show up, it's in there. So it'll come to the next generation. And then it might start showing up and revealing itself. And then it'll get to the next generation and it looks like it may have escaped because most of them didn't become drunks as far as you could see. But there's some traits that show themselves in secret and then eventually what's been happening in the dark Start showing up in the light, and you get all surprised. I didn't know he was like, it's in the genes. It's in the genes. <laughs> Y'all trying not to know what I'm. Yeah, yeah, it's in there. It's in there. Somewhere in our great grand's generation was some drinking people. Well, my great grandfather was a Native American. He had straight jet black hair. I never saw him. I just heard what my aunts used to say. My, my daddy was a good looking man. His straight jet black hair hanging off his shoulders. I wish he'd have left me. <laughs> his keen nose and sharp chin. I wish he'd left some of that. <laughs> you got the hair. <laughs> My great-grandmother was lily white. Looked like a cup of milk. She brought some stuff from her folk. My cousin, she would be, she would be a great-grandchild. Had this infection. They ran all kinds of tests. They couldn't, couldn't figure out where this come from. And so, they sat down one day and they started asking the questions. Tell me about your parents. Well, tell me about your grandparents. Well, tell me about your, what do you know? Do you know anything about your, well, yeah, my, my grandfather, great-grandfather was this. I'm told that my great-grandmother was this. And they said, oh, well, we would have never thought to look for this because this doesn't happen in people of color. This only shows up in Europeans and people, Caucasian. Caucasian folks. This, this, so we would have never thought, but it was in genes. Now, I'm going on. Some of you getting ripped. You, you, my great granddaddy was a preacher. There's still some stuff in him. My great granddaddy, my great granddaddy was a preacher, but the stuff was still in him. It came down. To the next generation, my grandma, my grandma, I was told she always walked around with a pistol. She had two rifles in the house and a little something. She, I, oof. <laughs> Miss 
Bessie, aren't you afraid to be walking out here? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Her sisters had long hair flowing down. And they used to say that David girls was the most beautiful girls in town. But there was also some fighting women. You know, it's, it's in them jeans. But in between there, we had some uncles and some aunts who had relationships with, 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 with corn liquor and, and pot liquor and with liquor. What they didn't buy, they knew how to make. We used to think that pot, black pot belly stove out there was for making soap. It not only made soap. You all looking at me. You didn't look at me because I'm putting my family out there. But yours is like mine. Yours is like mine. Your, your, we, you, you got some, you know. There's some, some stuff down. And the reason why today that I don't smoke pot I didn't have a relationship with a bottle of Hennessy, a Mostato, Grey Goose. You want me to stop before I call yours. A bud. <laughs> Underneath this cassock is a bunch of switches. The Holy Ghost got there before the switch could be flipped. Now, uh, y'all really should be clapping your not for me, for your own switch. And some of your switches got turned on, but God showed up in enough time to shut them down. And that's why you sitting in here instead of over there at Sahara's bar spinning around. Oh, come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Savior. Ay, 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 ay. Oh, there's some more stuff in the jeans. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't. Next time you walk through them church doors, your church outfit. You need to come in through them doors thanking God you shut the switch off. You shut the switch off. Thank you for shutting that switch down. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when God told Saul to kill everything, yeah, he meant even the stuff that looked good because Amalek's genes was even in the good stuff. You know this boy he spared? Agag. Shows up later. Okay. And so, now comes the moment. Truth. Samuel appears and inquires of Saul, did you do everything the Lord told you to do? You also have to see Samuel's position. He's standing here in hope. This time, I hope you got it right, because God is near about done with you. I hope you did. Please tell me you did what God told you to do. Because, see, you being mistake also means I made a mistake. Made a mistake. I'm the first prophet to anoint a king. And I don't want the first one to be the wrong one. But sometimes the first one is the wrong one to teach you how to choose differently thereafter. Please tell me. Did you? You can see Samuel said, Saul, did you do everything God told you to do? And just as Saul is opening his mouth to say, I killed all the sheep. Just as he said, as he parts his lips, the sheep start bleeding. (laughs) 
Saul, you didn't spare anything or anyone that God told you to take out, right? You really have to see this picture. While Saul was preparing his answer, the very thing he said he killed began to make noise. And then Saul acted like a mama from the south. Did you kill the sheep? And you hear the sheep bleating. It's like your mother catching you with your hands in the chocolate chip cookie jar. Chocolate all over your mouth, in between your teeth, on your hands and all over your face, and everything you touch. And your answer to the question, did you eat, did you eat chocolate? Did you eat them cookies I told you not to touch? And, and with, the, with the chocolate in between your, your black teeth, your brown lips, and your hands behind your back. I ain't touched them cookies. Not me. No. You really wish that was God that had caught you and not your mama. Cause she, you can see her reaching out by the nap of your neck and carrying you straight in front of a, a mirror, maybe. So what's all of that in your mouth and around your lips? And you know, you start telling more alternative Samuel is heartbroken and disappointed. He is hurt. And at the end of his relationship with Saul, you see, the Amalekites were not just the enemies of Israel and Samuel and Saul. They are the enemies of God. And when Saul didn't destroy them, as God had said, and save what he thought was the best for himself. This was not some little error, some mistake, or some misunderstanding. He was siding with the enemies of God and against God. You cannot be with your enemies. You cannot be with the enemies of God and with God at the same time. It just can't happen. Samuel is crushed, but he is the prophet of God. How he feels does not dismiss him from his responsibility to God and to these people. Saul's decision not to obey God was influenced, he says, by the people. I'm going to try to make this my last stop. So he lies about not killing the sheep, not killing the oxen, not killing the folk. And then he explains it. I didn't do what God told me to do because you see them people you see them people I didn't want the people to be upset with me now let's think this answer through because one of the things that I encounter in my work outside here is when you ask a question and people say I don't know so that is not the answer. You know something. You, you know, well, tell me what you do know. You know, that's the 16-year-old's national anthem. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you know something. Tell me something. Tell me what you think you know, what you thought you know. You, when you did this, what was running, you know, you do have one, even though every now and then it pauses, it stops, it shuts down, it needs to be rebooted. Occasionally, we have to look for it. But you got one. What were you thinking when you were thinking what you were thinking? So, so, so let's, let's go with this answer. You know, because I, I, I think reading this answer, standing on this side of the story, if I was Samuel, I think I would have just, please, I'd just slap you. You didn't do what God told you to do, listen, the very breath you breathe comes from God. So you didn't do what God told you to do. The eyes that you see with, the hands that you use, even the voice that you use to explain why you didn't do what God told you to do, the very mind that's in your cranium that you didn't do, what God, the reason you didn't do what God told you to do is not because you was afraid of God, but you was afraid of folk. Oh, by the way,
way, Saul, did you know the people was asking God to get rid of you? I didn't do what God told me to do because I was concerned about what the people would say. This is in response uh, to, uh, to, to Samuel asking, uh, why didn't you do what God told you to do? Siding with your friends, being influenced to go against God's directives for your life is never a good thing. Friends don't always have your best interest at heart when it comes to God. It is sad to say some friends want you to stay in sin with them so you won't leave them. Would that you prefer the promises of God, the covenants of God, than the attachment to people, to places, and to things. The entire 15th chapter details Saul's disobedience to God. Samuel says in summary, when you were nothing, and when, now, this is the last time When you were nothing and when you were nobody chasing donkeys, God chose you to be a leader to his people. This is the last conversation. You have dishonored God time and time again. You see, it's a dangerous thing to choose someone because of how they look. And I am almost at the conclusion of this lesson. But when we read about Saul, here is what is said. He is handsome. He is tall. He is good looking. He is his father's choices. son. When we compare him to David, we read that David is a worshiper, a psalmist, a man after God's own heart. When we read of his, we, 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 we read of his repentant heart, of him praying in the spirit. We read of David requesting of God to give him a clean heart, unprompted and without coaching. David is the example of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Saul is good looking. He's tall. He's handsome. He's the choices of his father's sons. What do you think about that? It's not much when you compare him to David. Let me close here today as we come to the nearing to the end of our Lenten journey. There is this individual call for each one of us to find those oxen. even find Agag because if you don't kill Agag he's going to grow up to become a man and what you spared when you should have taken it out has now become full blown and full grown what you don't kill when the opportunity provides you it will grow up and it will kill you. Samuel walks away from Saul. While walking away, Saul reaches for Samuel and tears away a piece of his garment. You ever have somebody talking to you with their back turned? It's as almost as if to say, I know you there, but you really don't matter anymore. Later for you. <laughs> he tears Samuel's garment. And Samuel is walking away from Saul. And this is the benediction that has no blessing. Just as you have torn my garment, God has torn the kingdom from you and given it 
to another. Samuel is walking away. And Saul is left with less than what was given to him. Of a truth and of a fact, we don't know how big the piece was that was torn, but it wasn't much. But all you left with is a rag from your riches. It's one thing to go from rags to riches. But it's a horrible thing when your rags, when your riches This is what you have left. And let me tell you, I'm quitting. We close. Here's what God does. He sends the same prophet down to Jesse's house. Samuel almost makes the same mistake again, and this is the reason why we get stuck sometimes with people in our lives, because... I don't see anybody that can replace you. You're looking for the same thing. That's why you can't see. Last story. I'm, 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 last story. Some of you are, are like me. I buy a phone. I plan to use it as long as it'll ring and make a call. They'll send me notices. We're fading this out. We've got new models coming in. And they'll say, real pretty, it's time for you to upgrade. And I'm saying, nah, as long as it's running. I held on to a phone one time so long, they sent me an email, they put a notice on my bill, and then they send a voice message to the phone. The last day that this phone will be operable is such and such a date. We will no longer service this model. Remember what you mean. I pay my bill. You keep paying the bill. You ain't gonna have no service. My 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 case, the, the hook snapped apart from the case, and so I was trying to find another case like that. So I, I'm going into Best Buy. I'm going into Staples, you name it, I'm walking in there. And you know, the people look at you, those Google lights, millennials, have a way of looking at you like, really? <laughs> yeah, boy, look, just go look in the case, <laughs> open the drawer, and see what's down in there. And they're saying, you know, <laughs> what lady was so nice to me in Best Buy, she says, sir, uh, the case that you're looking for, they stop making these phones so they don't make the cases anymore. Now, what you can do is, is there might be something over here that you can get this phone in. But the way that you're used to operating in it, snapping it off your hip, looking at because now, might I suggest I ain't spinning it. So, so I said, well, let's see if we can find one of these cases. And it looked like an eyeglass case wide. And, and you slide the phone in there. You had to push it down in there. And when, it, when you needed to answer it, you had to push it back out. Because, you know, actually, that case was not designed. <laughs> y'all go ahead and laugh. Because some of y'all done the same thing. And, and what some of you have done is, well, I just won't get the case. I'll just hold it in my hand and put it in my pocket. And you dialing folk. Every time you sit down, you dialing people. And they, hello, hello. You know, you know. No. That was one of them special dials. You know. What happens to people who think like me is that when something has come to its end, and there's still a little bit of life to it. You keep trying to make it, make it work. And it's dying. And so when the battery wouldn't charge, I 
I'd make a phone call and everything go dark. I'd get in the car, I'd plug it in and hook it up, and then just, you know, and then calls are dropping. L. James wouldn't know that I drive off a cliff. You keep dropping. No, no, no. No, it's, 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 you know. You know, you even start the conversation again. Do you think you have any old batteries lying around? And No. We are done with this. Some of you are saying, that's my story too. <laughs> I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to. But you know, we got some in here in this room every time something new starts getting announced and they start getting online pre-ordering. The next one is coming up. And then, let's see what the, let's see what it what it but here here's here's the reality. The new phone had a longer battery life. It had better memory. Things that I could access from my computer, I could access from my phone. And a lot of things, you know, you have a whole lot of stuff. It was becoming so that everything that you did anywhere else, you can now do in one place. Here's what God did. He sends Samuel out to the field. Anoints this boy as king. David stays out there watching over sheep, singing his song, having conversations with people up in the air, talking to God. And just as Saul is losing his pure mind, they send for David to come play music. In the old Lord. I put my trust in the all I put my trust in the all I This man who was crawling up the walls, his fingernails out like a, like paws, having conversations with nobody. He's resort, he's resorting to to witches and and, and people, to divination, and when he'd go in a manic fit, his replacement sings him back. In the In the old Lord, I put my trust in the I know I've taken some time this morning and I've gone this way, that way, and the other way, but to the end of this, here's what we see in Samuel, perhaps in ourselves. Samuel cried and grieved at the loss of Saul. He had invested in Saul, tutored him in the things and in the ways of God, prayed for him, petitioned God for him, talked to him, coached him in what was right before God, and yet he chose foolishly. Have you ever been there? Have you had to live that? Investing in someone who could not realize their own value. So we can understand Samuel crying and mourning, but even grief has a dateline. You can't live in loss. You can't live in grief. You can't mope and expect that life will yield you its benefits. God didn't tell Samuel not to cry. He gave him some time to mourn his loss, to feel and to heal from his pain. And now... He has to get to work. There's a kingdom that has to be managed, a king to be anointed and a nation to be built. You cannot do this crying and grieving at the same time. 
Samuel, make this your last tear. Fill your flask with oil, and I'm sending you to Jesse's house, for I have provided for myself. Well, brothers and sisters, as you are on your Lenten journey, you and I need to dry up now. We have cried over lost relationships, friendships, partnerships, which God has rejected. He has given us time to grieve, to hurt, and to mourn our loss. The past is indeed the past, and it is not coming back. No matter how hard you think about it, wish for it, want to go back and make changes to it, you cannot. So go ahead and cry your last tear today, because there is a kingdom that needs to be built. Go ahead and cry your last tear today. There's a people and a nation to be built. In those people and in that nation are your sons and, in your, and your daughters, your husbands and your wives, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, nieces and nephews, aunts and uncles. In those people and in that nation, there are those who have given up on life, lost hope, and a thrust and a thrive for life. You must give up grieving over what God has rejected and get your oil and anoint God's future. There are blessings to be had, promises to be fulfilled, covenants to be enjoyed, and they are not behind you, but in front of you. God is getting you ready for what he has already gotten ready for you. You can stop crying so you can see your future. I see myself in the future. Things look so much better. Would you stand in, in a walk in an act of faith? Just find five folk, hold them by the hand, and you ain't got to tarry with them. This is your prayer line today. And tell them your future is so much better than your past. Stop crying. Yeah, yeah. Go find four more. Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your future is so much better than your past. Stop crying. Yeah. Your future is so much better than your past. Stop crying. Stop crying. Your future is so much better than your past. Stop crying. Stop crying. Stop crying. Stop crying. Yeah, yeah. Keep moving until you get five folk. The number of favor. Yeah, yeah. You can stop crying. Your, your future is so much better. Then your past, so much better than your past. Hallelujah! So much better. You can stop crying. You can stop crying. Your future is so much better than your past. Than your past. Thank you for joining us today. If you wish to be a blessing to this ministry, you may do so by following the directions on your screen. We thank you for your generous giving. May the Lord bless you.